Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Okay. You've got a great day ahead of you, listening-wise. Um, this is soon to be the chance to hear the quartets in an entire program of their own choice. You'll hear that in the hall. Some really fun repertoire, some great curating. I'm glad you're inside today. There's the smoke from Jasper is encroaching a little bit, so we, we will not have the gorgeous views of the mountains today. Um, and I don't see any rain in the forecast, so um, it's a good day to be in, in the hall and listening to music. Um, this uh, talk by my dear friend Sebastian Ruth is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Sebastian, um, uh, when he was in a string quartet, um, came and uh, worked with the St. Lawrence Quartet when I was um, a member of that group and then came out to Banff a couple times. Uh, Sebastian is one of the founders of something called Community Music Works in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and he'll talk to you about that. He's a MacArthur Fellow uh, winner or recipient um, for his work building Community Music Works for revisioning what um, music can be in a community as a change agent, as a community builder. Um, he's done just stunning work in that regard, really considered one of the, one of the leaders of our time in that area, um, a very generous guy. When he was here on his own um, creative residency focusing just on music making with his quartet colleagues, when they weren't community building, um, uh, we sent them out um, to the local high school just as a treat and um, and how they threw themselves into that project is is uh, is just one little example of how they throw themselves into everything they do when the word community is involved. It's great to share this community with uh, with Sebastian. I turn it over to him. Thank you Sebastian for, for making the journey here. Coming back home to Banff. <laughs> Sebastian. Thank you, sir. Hey, what? This is a little... Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. As Barry said, this is a homecoming of sorts. I'm so thrilled to be back at Banff and um, here for the first time at BISC. So it's a treat to be with you. Um, as Barry said, I'm, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, uh, in the Northeast. If you don't know Providence, it's a small city of about 175,000, um, uh, large immigrant populations, especially from uh, West Africa and Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Um, and like many cities in the US, um, a very sort of racially divided city. Um, and the histories of that place kind of inscribe the the divisions, the highway runs th through and sort of makes racial boundaries. And um, growing up, I got bit by the string quartet bug, like many, um, and found that I uh, wanted to just invest a lot of my time and energy and eventually um, professional life in string quartet playing, um, but was really kind of faced with this question of how do you uh, make music uh, and with, with all of that passion that goes into string quartet playing and music making, but deploy that nuclear energy of, um, of string quartet playing um, towards some kind of uh, social good um, and feeling like the classical music world, as, as we well know, um, it is a pretty narrow world, um, typically white and affluent, and, um, a and how, how could I be a musician uh, and feel like I'm contributing energy toward, uh, toward not only playing for a, a broader public, um, but feeling like the, the energy that goes into music making is really an energy of, uh, of building community and building a sense of justice. So, um, I went to school in Providence, 
just getting my clicker going here. And um, after graduating, uh, applied for a fellowship to start a quartet residency in an urban community in Providence um, with the idea that w what would it be to enter into a collaborative relationship with the community, um, with young people, with their families, with neighbors, um, and to, to feel like we were building a, a diverse community uh, and, and co-creating what musicianship could look like. Um, and so uh, this is what we started. It's a project, as, as Barry mentioned, called Community Music Works. And uh, this is our headquarters uh, on a main street in Providence. We thought, well, maybe a, a string quartet, you can see the storefront on the left says string quartet, the one on the right says community music works, um, could just have a, a storefront presence and make itself um, as much as possible a, a normal part of the life of the city. So you walk down the street and you see the um, auto fix-it garage, and you see a diner, and you see a string quartet, and you see a takeout joint, and you see a gas station. <laughs> um, and, and that, you know, maybe it could become normalized in that way, uh, so that young people walking home from school would see musicians working actively and feel that this um, is a normal feature of life, and, and you don't have to leave your neighborhood or go to a, um, a, a downtown, you know, fancy venue to, to be involved with music making, but also you could decide to open the door, as young people do, and walk in and join in. Um, one of my inspirations was an uh, educational philosopher named Maxine Green, uh, who was writing about the, the connection of education, the arts, and social change. Um, and this is a quote from Maxine Green. She said, I hope there exists and that I can speak to a community of educators committed to emancipatory pedagogy, particularly in the domain of the arts. And when I read this in the kind of, in, in my college years and thinking about how this musicianship piece could work, I thought, you know, th this is it. It's emancipatory pedagogy is, is a whole field, right? Lib liberation um, education thinking about how is education a path to greater freedom, um, but particularly in the domain of the arts. What does that mean? How can we rethink um, music education so that it is a pathway toward identity development, toward seeing the world in a different way? And I also um, drew inspiration from Bill Strickland in Pittsburgh, who uh, here you see him in a ceramic studio with a young person. But Bill's own story was that um, he kind of fell in love with art making in high school. Uh, he had a very influential art teacher who got him into the pottery studio and that became a world for him. And when he was still in college, um, he uh, got access to, and I'm not sure the details, but a row house in um, the Manchester neighborhood of Pittsburgh, which was a, a neighborhood that had experienced disinvestment and um, similar dynamics of segregation. Um, and he started a ceramic studio in the basement and just invited young people who were hanging out on the street to come in and work with him. And it wasn't outreach. Um, it's a word I... I, I I um, have some critical relationship with. He wasn't saying, this is the best thing, it's gonna save your life, I need to show you. He was saying, this is something I'm really passionate about and it's really important to me. And the door's open, like if you wanna come in, let's work together. Let's form what he called a craftsman's guild. Uh, and the Manchester Craftsman's Guild grew eventually out of the basement of this row house and he combined it with a job training center and it became this incredibly um, uh, well-known multi-million dollar facility in, that's become a very successful thing in Pittsburgh. But the nature of invitation was what really struck me. How can you have an ensemble in residence in a neighborhood where, again, it's not about saviorism, it's not 
classical music is going to save your life or we need to show you the way or anything. But if we are passionate about what we're doing and we can create uh, a sense of reciprocal invitation, um, uh, can you invite me into musical traditions or cultural traditions that are important to you can, and I can invite you into the practice of music making that I know um, that, uh, that maybe we could create something powerful. So I'll, today I'll, I'll share a bit about our work, the details. I'll sh share a little bit more about the um, kind of underlying inspirations and some of the maybe the ancestors of our work and, uh, and then share a little bit of the artistic practices that, um, uh, or, or artistic projects that make up our artistic identity and the kinds of questions we continue to ask. So, an ensemble in residence. Um, this should not be foreign to all of you who are here thinking about ensembles all week. Um, continues to be, you know, the nucleus of, of this work. Some of our work happens on concert stages. Um, some of it in other venues. We work with about 150 uh, young people who study string instruments um, for free throughout the year. Uh, they are um, performers, they are learners, they are in some ways, um, at best, co-creators of, like I said, this musical community and the idea of where and how musicians should make their work in the community. Um, the where and how is a question we always like to play with. Uh, in this case, it was a Mendelssohn octet on, this, on the street outside of our storefront with some balloons, you can see. For, I forget the occasion, but we were celebrating something with Mendelssohn. Um, uh, or a neighborhood deli. Or in some cases, young people forming quartets of their own. And uh, this was at the neighborhood fruit cellar uh, up the street. Um, this, this was a particularly neat moment um, some, some years ago. A group of alums, these were alums by this point, um, started a group they called the Ro Rhode Island Latino String Quartet and, um, and would play some gigs as that group and, and got to attend actually a really neat um, uh, Latinx music festival in, in the West Coast. Uh, I just like that picture. There's no real story. <laughs> this is an end, end of year orchestra uh, performance when all the students come together. Um, there's actually a, a neat tradition in recent years where we choose an anthem and the young people are part of that selection process that will culminate the year. Um, one year it was the um, protest anthem, We Shall Overcome. Um, one year it was the, the song, This Land is Your Land. One year it was um, Pueblo Unido, and, and the idea is through the course of many months, um, young people study the song, its history, and, um, and they kind of make new meaning out of it. So there's actually a big tradition that maybe people are familiar with that in the, in the song We Shall Overcome, it's been adapted to different social movements over its history. Um, it started actually as a labor struggle song for tobacco workers in the 40s became, of course, a big civil rights anthem. Um, and, uh, and so students wrote their own verses as, as part of that. I guess there was a story to that slide. Um, another aspect is on, on Friday nights, our, our teens get together for a program we call Phase Two, um, which is where they start playing chamber music, have a, a meal together. Food is a really important feature of community building, no matter where you are. Sally Borden Center is a great example, right? Um, and, and take part in a week, uh, an hour-long discussion about issues in their lives that are important to them, um, or, you know, sort of uh, held together by the common theme of inquiry into social justice. So this is a, an image from, you can see the pandemic, everyone's wearing a mask, but of that gathering on a Friday night, um, and they eventually prepare a... Um, an, an event, an annual event called the Youth Salon, where they combine performance and inquiry and dialogue with the audience. Um, another feature is um, work with guest artists. 
this is Johnny Gandelsman, whom some of you may know, incredible artist, violinist, um, another person who rethinks the, the, the way that music uh, works in this world. Um, but we uh, commissioned a piece together with Johnny um, based in salsa music, and it was a violin concerto with string orchestra and salsa band and violin solo. Um, so this was so part of the working process, one of our high school students working with Johnny in the, in the rehearsals. I actually have a slide coming up um, that shows the performance of that one. Um, and uh, some of our guest artists have joined us in, uh, in some of these opportunities to, th again, rethink where and how. This is a neighborhood taqueria, and Emmanuel Axe joined us for some piano quintets. Um, <laughs> In the, in the Takaria. He said it was the first time he had played an electric keyboard in public. That was exciting. Um, but, um, but no, it was this really wonderful series that we have developed with the Takaria. Um, they have a tagline called authentic Mexican cuisine at every comfort level, meaning um, you can get the, the basic things that many people know and you can get the, the authentic food. And we kind of created a poster together that also said like, authentic classical music at every comfort level. Um, which, which was to say, like, if, if you are wandering in to get your burrito and happen to see a concert, there's no, there's no rules about how you're supposed to listen, right? You're not, you don't have to know the music. You don't have to know how to behave. You can clap whenever you want, that kind of thing. Um, or if you are a fan of Emmanuel Axe and you want to come and hear a little Brahms quintet, you can also do that. Um, Along the line of yeah, rethinking, this was a pandemic initiative called CMW Delivers. Of course, there was a lot more delivery services during the, um, during the pandemic. So a local theater company lent us their portable stage, and um, it got hitched to the back of my Subaru. Um, and, uh, and so this was a performance in a, in a lot that actually we will develop as our future building. Um, another way to kind of bring music around town um, during the pandemic. So um, let me switch now to some of the ancestors. So this is John Dewey. Uh, I mentioned Maxine Green a few minutes ago. She was very much um, influenced uh, by, by Dewey and, and his thinking about the, the place of arts in, in society. Uh, and this quote, I'll read it, is from the Art as Experience, 1930s text, where he wrote a whole book about philosophy of art. And he was, um, he was very concerned even then, in the 30s, about the, uh, the problem of art being relegated to a separate realm from daily life. And he said the project is to, <clears throat> quote, restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are recognized to constitute experience. How do you restore that continuity, right? And then he goes on to say, you know, these boundaries are so artificial where we think art happens in museums and concert halls and opera houses, and that's art. And then you go and you live your daily life and you cook a meal and you work in your garden and you suffer grief and loss. And, but they're, they're kind of relegated to separate places, right? And he said, not only is that, are those artificial distinctions, but the reasons we have concert halls and museums are not always very art-centric. Like, museums are very often a nationalistic impulse, he would say, or an imperialistic, you know, let's show our... Um, the wares of, of all the lands we've conquered. And he said, like, it's deeply troubling, the motivations that have built some of these places. But it also makes us think art is on a, is a, far, on a faraway pedestal, right? Um, and, he, and he said, you know, in this, in this opening chapter, he said, people are going to think this is blasphemous, but not only um, does art n not have to exist in these spaces, but, um, but it has nothing to do with them. It has much more to do with the grief the cooking, the garden, the human impulses. And so he talks about this word, he uses this word experience to say, like, we all have this human life with these rhythms of emotion and rhythms of how we, um, uh, how we experience things. 
And that's actually where art comes from. He said there's probably more similarity between a work of art and someone getting that like intense satisfaction from um, cooking a meal than there is the work of art and the museum. So um, I, I feel a lot of um, sympathy with these ideas, right? The idea of a, of a quartet on a busy street maybe having more connection to why we play music um, than sometimes the concerts in a concert hall. Uh, not that I don't love those experiences as well. But um, it was fun to learn that the architects of um, the Works Progress Administration in the U.S. in the 30s uh, were students of Dewey's. So um, this was, if you know this history, the um, you know, huge effort in the U.S. To, uh, to put people back to work during and after the um, Great Depression. And we're familiar with roads and bridges and, and, and things that might bear this plaque if you've been in, through the US and certain sidewalks still have this plaque built by the Works Progress Administration because all this federal money went into just putting people back to work doing whatever, right? And there's also very famous public art. There's murals in public libraries and post offices in the US um, that were done by uh, painters in that, in that time. They were hired to get back to work by painting in public spaces. I wasn't aware of the Federal Music Project. Um, that was another branch where they also put unemployed musicians back to work, um, starting WPA schools. Um, and the idea being this, again, shouldn't be the preserve of those who can afford it, this should be um, something broadly accessible and, and public. And in fact, there were um, WPA orchestras formed um, that recorded, sorry, it's a little pixelated here. Um, some uh, orchestras still exist that started as WPA orchestras. And, um, and again, the, the architects of these federal arts programs around music, um, and, and art and theater and painting um, had been going to Dewey lectures and hearing about his complaint with this separation of art in the everyday. Um, I say this with ignorance and self-consciousness that in Canada things are so much better in terms of government support of the arts. Um, this is not the norm in the US. Um, after <clears throat> these sort of exceptional efforts like, like the WPA. But um, Another kind of descendant of Dewey's ideas at that time was Black Mountain College in North Carolina in the 30s and 40s, um, which was an experimental um, arts college um, started mostly by um, uh, artists who were fleeing Nazi Germany and trying to create an idealized place to study art. Um, and Joseph and Annie Albers and others um, <clears throat> were, were some of the main teachers. But then musicians like John Cage came and Merce Cunningham and um, Buckminster Fuller, all these, all these sort of artistic luminaries came. But in this radical experimental college where it, they ran it as a democracy, all the students and faculty came together to decide how they would run the garden, how they would prepare the meals, how classes should happen. This is, I just love the image. You know, they're on a porch um, in rural North Carolina um, looking at color through these, through these pictures. Um, but, but there was something about that collaborative aspect, right, that was also influenced by Dewey, um, but that speaks to this idea that it's, it's not a hierarchical structure. You know, you don't need the art as an established idea to kind of stay um, uh, preserved in, in its ways, in the ways we know it. Um, but you can have students and teachers kind of breathing new life into these things. Last Dewey quote. Um, it, it goes beyond, so Dewey, Dewey goes beyond that sort of initial idea and says, actually it's about art, 
if, if we are really breathing fully uh, into it, um, having an impact on how the world unfolds. And so he said, only imaginative vision elicits the possibilities that are interwoven within the texture of the actual. Art has been the means of keeping alive the sense of purposes that outrun evidence and meanings that transcend indurated habit. I love the image, first of all, of imaginative vision interwoven in the texture of the actual. So you just, like, I think of a tapestry, and there's these threads, um, the tapestry of our actual daily life. But those threads of imagination are um, what starts to spark what could be, right? What, what change could happen? We have to imagine it before we can do it. And art has the means of keeping alive that sense of purposes that outrun evidence, that um, transcend our habit, right? So we, in a, in a I started by, by talking about this sort of um, intractable social dynamics in a city and how can you weave a sense of alternative possibilities into that? And Dewey says, it's only art. There's another quote I didn't put up here, but he said, art is more moral than moralities. Um, and in that language, he was talking about like religious precepts and, and, um, and people who talk about the, the moral concepts. And he said, actually, often when you talk about moral uh, moralities, you're talking about the past, what things worked in the past. But he said, art actually looks to the future. It's always the artists who are thinking about new and different ways. So from that, go to a couple of artists who I think exemplify that kind of thinking. This is Nina Simone, um, who, as you probably know, had a very, um, uh, had, had different chapters in her musical life. You know, s starting as a classical pianist, w wanting to be the first great black female pianist, um, and getting denied access to Curtis, even though she was um, definitely of the caliber because of race and racism, eventually starting to sing to, to make some money, became commercially very successful singing love songs, and in the early 60s um, said, I, I need to sing civil rights songs, right, and wrote Mississippi Goddamn and other things that sort of became problematic for her commercial success because the white radio hosts didn't want to play these provocative anthems, but she grew more and more to be this um, powerful figure in the civil rights movement. Um, and there's a quote from a wonderful documentary, if you haven't seen it, um, called What Happened, Miss Simone, which is, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times you're living in? Um, somebody was was asking her about this change from writing love songs to writing protest songs. And she said, this, this is just the nature of being an artist. You have to be able to reflect the times that you're living in. From an earlier time, um, Pablo Casals, the great cellist and conductor that we often associate with the Bach cello suites, you know, pulling the Bach cello suites out of obscurity. Um, and he also has um, uh, a chapter of his life where he becomes an activist, uh, in, particularly in, in Spain in the 30s at the sort of birth of the Spanish um, Republic and a, and a new democracy. And he, pour, he sort of gives up a lot of his touring and he pours a lot of his energy into building an orchestra there. And, um, and then the fascists come in and he is... Um, you know, devastated by this and spends really the rest of his career, the rest of his life until the 70s, um, uh, resisting the Franco dictatorship, going into exile and um, taking whatever opportunity he can because of his stature to meet with world leaders and talk about the cause of democracy and justice. And a, a quote from his memoir, an artist with a conscience cannot separate himself from certain political issues, chief among those uh, justice and freedom. Um, so I bring, I bring all these 
influence is in, just as um, uh, texture to the, um, to the ideas we're trying to work from, the questions we're trying to work from. Um, and I'll, I'll just share a few different artistic projects that we've um, engaged with, the way we're trying to animate these questions in, um, in, in, in performance. Um, this was a, a piece we commissioned for Community Music Works and the Kronos Quartet um, from a good friend, Karim Rustam, um, whose works are beautiful. You should, you should know Karim's work. Um, called A Voice Exclaiming, and it was um, in 2013 um, when the Civil War in Syria was still in, in its first years. Um, uh, but this was a uh, really lovely um, finale. This, the Syria connection is that there's, there's a, um, uh, a that, that theme sort of goes throughout the piece. But um, <clears throat> this is a lovely finale where you can see the CMW um, um, ensemble on the kind of left of the stage. You can see Kronos in the center stage, and on the right was um, a quartet of young people, and then the front of the stage was the finale where other young people came to, to play this um, final dabke, um, Arabic dance. Um, <clears throat> this was a, a project in um, 2010. Um, after the, there's cardboard, cardboard cutouts of Barack and Michelle Obama in the back. That's not real people. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> at the 2008 US presidential election, and the U.S. elects its first black president, um, we got into a discussion of like, what does this mean in the, the long arc of civil rights movement and worked with um, uh, Kirby Vasquez, who's in the white shirt in the front, and our colleague Jesse Montgomery, um, also whose, whose work as a musician and composer is phenomenal, and, and you, you probably know her name, uh, and you should if you don't. Um, at that time, Jesse was a, a colleague of ours in Community Music Works uh, and starting to, starting to write music. So um, Jesse and Kirby wrote a piece together called Anthem where um, they, uh, Jesse blended musically the Star Spangled Banner, which is the US national anthem, with Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is considered black national anthem. Uh, and Kirby drew from different historical speeches and created a sort of spoken word part to it. Um, so this was something with students and our, and our quartet at that time. Um, this picture, uh, you can see kind of in the corner um, up there, it says Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Project. This was during the time they were building the MLK Memorial in Washington, D.C. Um, and so we had the opportunity to be in D.C. Uh, uh, we were getting an award from, at the White House, which is exciting, but we ended up deciding to bring this whole ensemble of young people with us um, to play in a few different settings. This one is at the National Endowment for the Arts. But, um, but thought just spiritually being able to participate in the building of the MLK Memorial, even though it was um, fenced off and we were just sort of outside, felt like a good, a good musical cornerstone to help them lay. Um, this, is, uh, this is that piece I was referring to with Johnny Gandelsman. Uh, called Fantasia, um, and he's holding the hand of the composer and band leader, um, Gonzalo Grau. Um, and yeah, Gonzalo wrote this piece. You can see kind of the, the salsa band in the middle and the orchestra made up of uh, the Music Works Collective, which is the name of the ensemble after we got bigger than a string quartet, um, and, and young people. And I guess the thing I would just draw out about this one is, um, we're just thinking a lot about the um, um, multiple musical traditions in our, in our community and um, how a young person who's growing up with salsa music as um, the music they hear in their families um, connects that world with the string playing world that they access at Community Music Works. And you know, how can we continue to live into those questions of how the musical boundaries also are somewhat artificial? Um, 
and that if we can help young people become musically fluent, um, that they could apply that fluency to playing a lot of different kind of musical styles. Um, so this was a particularly rich moment of being able to have them be the orchestra in the salsa um, piece, but also how could we create a kind of community festival moment out of this? Um, so it wasn't just a um, concert that happened in the kind of normal spaces and, um, and traditions of concert music, but, uh, but how could this have a feel of a community event that might be familiar um, in the Latinx community in our neighborhood. So it started with a, a dinner prepared by a Venezuelan restaurant, and then um, there was the concert, and then spontaneously it kind of broke into a, a dance party at the end. So again, just like how, how can we be not necessarily fixed in the things that we as classically trained string players think of as concert, um, and, um, and allow those traditions to expand and change. This is a picture of the same project happening outdoors, um, but I just love the picture. <laughs> um, this brother and sister just started to salsa, d dance salsa at the, uh, at the end of the performance. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is um, the, the next project on our horizon. Um, so this has been uh, a, a uh, project over our many years, this is 25 years now, um, that has been largely dispersed throughout our neighborhoods. We started in um, pop-up settings, um, doing work in community centers and schools where young people already um, were there for after-school programming or daycare, and just saying, well, you know, let's make this as accessible as possible by just being in the spaces where young people show up. Um, and so uh, you saw performances in Taqueria, you saw performances outdoors, you, you know, performances in the deli. Of course, we play in concert halls as well. But um, uh, increasingly, there's been this question of what, what could a space um, that's really d built around the, the concept of this uh, organization, what could a space look like? Um, and so we're going to do it. Um, this is a rendering of a, a building that we're set to build. Um, and uh, it will ha it's right at the corner. You saw that, you saw that empty lot in one of the slides. Um, it will have a, about a 100-seat 100 100 seat performance space, a cafe, again, because community building happens around food and music, but food. Um, and the cafe will be um, open to the public during the morning and lunchtime hours, closed to the public and become a hangout spot for young people and families in the afternoon and evenings. Um, of course, teaching and rehearsal spaces, um, student spaces where they, they can kind of claim and, and hang out. And um, so obviously we're excited. This will be a, this will be a, a, a neat moment for this project. Um, spent a lot of time with architects over the last many years thinking, yes, but, um, how do you make a building that isn't trying to become a school of a community school of the arts, isn't trying to become a concert hall, but is really trying to animate, <coughs> excuse me, the values <coughs> that I've been talking about, um, where it's deeply um, connected to community traditions, very accessible, where it has an image of welcoming. Um, but also where the division between performance and learning gets kind of blurred. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so that's been the, the work on the architectural side is to sort of ask those questions all along. Um, <clears throat> but there's an, another set of questions we've been asking ourselves, which is um, what does it mean to, to build a building um, in this neighborhood that has had these, uh, this history of disinvestment and racism and the sort of social forces that, um, um, that have made life for young people challenging. Um, <clears throat> and also 
you know, as I think is, is um, a wonderful practice here in Canada, there's an increasing question of what does it mean to um, locate land uh, that was inherently stolen hundreds of years ago. Um, <clears throat> so we're asking these questions and, um, and, and also questions of, of gentrification and how a shiny new arts building in the context of this urban community um, would bring about um, the unintended consequence of rising property values because it's now an arts district or something and displacement of the families who live there. So all, all a complex set of questions. Um, and so s a friend and advisor said, well, you don't, you don't run away from those questions. You live into those questions. And maybe you make art about those questions. Um, so this was a project that called Traces that we um, performed last year. We commissioned the composer Sha Pong Lu to work with us on a kind of two-year oral history project and, and, and research project <coughs> to document stories of people's memories of that neighborhood, um, to do research into the indigenous history of this place and to the many hundreds of years of histories that have taken place, um, and then to create a work about it. And, and so her work included here a spoken word poet who is a, a member of this community, um, uh, an elder from the Hmong community, Southeast Asian Hmong community, um, a storyteller and others whose, um, whose works ended up being coming part of the piece. I don't have a slide of the performance of the piece itself. Um, but we did it on the land um, as a sort of gesture of Again, a kind of musical groundbreaking. Um, because in the end, it's like none of these, I don't think, questions have single answers. But I think that the, the process is continuing to ask the questions and, and live and breathe into them. I'll close with Grace Lee Boggs. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Grace Lee Boggs' work. Died not long ago at age 100. Um, a great uh, activist uh, through almost every significant social struggle in the second half of the 20th century in the U.S. Um, uh, and she said, we need artists to create new images that will liberate us from our preoccupation with constantly expanding <coughs> production and consumption and open up space in our hearts and minds to imagine. And I love the way that she, maybe picking up on that thread from Dewey, uh, um, knowingly or unknowingly, um, places artists in that place of helping in this project of liberation by creating new images. Like, how do we see a different way of being? Right. Um, so my last slide is just the gathered community in our in front of our storefronts there, um, including some alien puppets in the front. Um, this is a, a celebration, a sort of street front celebration um, after that. DC awards that I, that I referenced. Um, but just to say, this is an on, ongoing experiment, an ongoing question of how we continue to co-create a musical community with these intentions in mind. So thank you, um, and I'll open it up for dialogue. Yeah.